material in the previous lecture in this series. In that lecture, we covered the nature of the basic nuclear weapon effects, with primary attention to their behavior in the case of airburst weapons. Today, we will take up the ground burst. You'll remember that the lowest airburst is one in which the fireball is just above the ground, not contacting the surface. Our ground burst begins with the fireball touching the surface and applies to any lower burst, including those which are entirely underground. These differences in burst orientation do not create any new or different effects, but they do introduce variations of the three basic effects, blast, thermal radiation, and nuclear radiation. So far as these effects are concerned, there is no substantial difference between the lowest air burst position and the highest ground burst, technically slightly lower, but effectively in the same area. As the burst is lowered still more, the fireball boundary is located progressively deeper in the ground, and the burst characteristics shift away from those of the air burst category and become entirely typical of the ground burst. This shift is gradual through a transition zone with no sharp boundaries. The characteristics may be somewhere in the middle with effects belonging to both categories in the case of a zero height burst with a bomb sitting right on the ground. This point is logically called a contact surface burst, a sort of way station in the ground burst category as we've defined it. It might seem more reasonable to use this contact surface burst as the dividing point between air bursts and ground bursts. But there's a specific reason that we'll take up later for putting the dividing point about one fireball radius above the surface. Now to examine the effects of a ground burst. We'll start with one that is centered on or close to the ground surface. A substantial quantity of earth is vaporized by the intense heat of the fireball. Pressures of hundreds of thousands of pounds per square inch on the Earth's surface displace or throw out material. And in addition, these pressures cause an actual downward compression of the soil. These three factors operate together to form a crater, a major characteristic of any true ground burst. In dimensions, the crater is much wider than it is deep, even in soft, dry soil. Sample dimensions will be on the order of 65 feet radius and 25 feet depth for a one kiloton weapon. Plastic deformation of the soil plus material blown out of the center combine to produce a substantial raised lip around the crater. As viewed in a cross section or profile sketch, this lip is observed to be roughly one crater radius in width and its height will approximate one quarter of the crater depth. In hard rock, the crater may average out around 10% less in radius and depth than the dry soil size, while in water-saturated soil, it might run nearly twice as wide and a third shallower. Surrounding the hole is a region of cracked, disturbed soil called the rupture zone, perhaps half of the crater radius in thickness. Outside the rupture zone is another zone of approximately the same thickness called the plastic zone, in which the soil is permanently displaced without visible rupture. In rock, very little of this plastic deformation will occur. In addition to digging a crater, a ground burst also sends a shock wave or front radiating outward through the ground in all directions. From the standpoint of damage to underground structures, this shock is a comparatively short-ranged affair. Significant damage is generally limited to the radius of permanent displacement of the soil around the crater, becoming minor at even slightly greater ranges. We can now go on to the type of burst in which the center of detonation is below the surface of the ground. The fireball's light is visible more briefly, and the column of ejected dirt is more vertical, with less radial spread than in the case of the surface burst. For a weapon of any given yield, as the depth of burst is increased, 
the crater diameter also increases up to a maximum figure. Once that maximum diameter is attained, no increase is obtained by deeper burial. In fact, any deeper burst gives a narrower crater. This situation is reflected in a curve based on a one kiloton yield plotting depth of burst against crater radius. The narrowing of the crater is clearly indicated once the maximum crater radius has been passed. More important, note how rapidly the crater radius increases as the burst depth is lowered from a few feet above the surface to a few feet underground. Even at the relatively shallow depth of 20 feet, a one kiloton burst gives almost a maximum crater radius. Increasing the burst depth by as much as 500% will only increase the radius by some 16%. This rapid early increase is fortunate for military use because under field conditions, due to practical limitations, it is desired to produce the required crater with a relatively shallow burst. For example, one kiloton at a burst depth of 50 feet gives an effectively maximum crater diameter. To give you a feeling for the dimensions involved, this would amount to about 100 yards, about one football field across. However, a megaton burst at the same operational depth of 50 feet will be relatively very shallow, scaling way over here on the basic curve at a point equivalent to only five feet deep for one kiloton, and obviously far short of the right depth for obtaining a maximum crater radius for that large yield. However, even from the 50-foot burst depth, the megaton shot will still give us a dry soil crater nearly six football fields across and deep enough to hold a 20-story building, certainly big enough for most purposes. I mentioned before that crater radius from a given burst will vary as the cube root of the yield. It's important to remember that the crater's depth will vary only as the fourth root of the yield. So increases in yield will affect depth proportionately much less than they will diameter. As usual, we take a one kiloton yield for our basic curve, which plots crater depth against depth of burst. Comparing this curve with our crater radius versus depth of burst curve, we see quite different rates of development. Whereas a burst depth as shallow as 20 feet gives us close to a maximum crater radius, it gives only a little more than half of the maximum possible crater depth for this yield. To get maximum crater depth for one kiloton, we should need a burst depth near 100 feet, which we observe to be double our previously selected 50 foot depth. In practice, under field conditions and with weapons larger than a kiloton, we are seldom going to obtain the maximum possible crater depths. Keep in mind that actual crater depths may be obscured by falling and sloughing of loose soil back into the crater to form a false bottom at a considerably shallower depth than the true bottom. For this reason, our curves, which deal with the visible and apparent bottom, will indicate situations for very deep shots where this crater depth is less than the actual burst depth. Returning to our earlier sketch, it should be noted that underground burst crater sizes are affected by soil consistency, as in the case of surface bursts. A burst in hard rock will slightly reduce both the depth and width of a crater from what it would be in dry soil. In saturated soil, however, the depth will be reduced, but the crater diameter is considerably increased. Underground bursts produce both a rupture zone and a plastic zone around the crater, as in the case of surface bursts, and will also produce a ground shock of the same general characteristics. Note also that increasing the burst depth will increase the shock intensity at a given distance from the given burst. Looking now at the other basic effects, we find an interesting point. A given air burst, expanding freely, yields a certain size of fireball. If a bomb of the same yield is detonated down on the ground, however, the fireball can't expand freely downward 
and is displaced into an approximate hemisphere whose size would correspond to the upper half of an airburst fireball of roughly twice the actual yield. Barring other factors, the effects emitted by this hemisphere could also be expected to equal those from an airburst of twice the yield. However, other factors do exist. You'll remember that an airburst produces both an incident and a reflected blast wave, which at some distance from ground zero can merge into a single and much more powerful shock front, the mock stem, thus greatly extending the range of the overpressures involved. At the distance from zero, where the Mach effect is of importance, these are necessarily the lower bracket overpressures, roughly those under 12 pounds per square inch. When the shot is a contact surface burst or an underground burst, only a single hemispherical shock front is emitted. So there is no merging of incident and reflected waves to give Mach reinforcement of the lower overpressures. Without this reinforcement, height of burst curves for a given yield show us that the lower overpressures from a surface burst have much less range than those same overpressures from an air burst at a height which optimizes the Mach effect. It is worth repeating that the higher overpressures do get their greatest range from contact surface bursts and lose range steadily as burst elevation is increased. Now, as the burst center is moved below the surface, our height of burst curves can be connected to their underground counterparts, depth of burst curves. These show that the horizontal ranges of given peak overpressures along the surface are very rapidly reduced as depth of burst is increased. The reduction is not actually linear, as can be seen by enlarging the scale of the vertical axis by a factor of 50 for easier study. These curves for a one kiloton shot show that from a burst depth as shallow as 35 feet, practically none of the higher overpressures above 12 PSI will have any significant range on the surface. This is also true for other yields at the same scaled depth. The depth of burst and the horizontal range of given peak overpressures will vary about as the cube root of the yield. Next subject, thermal effect. Looking again at a low yield contact surface burst, we see that the fireball brilliance is much less than that of a comparable air burst. Thermal energy is lost in forming the crater and infusing and vaporizing a quantity of the soil, which is carried aloft in the cloud. More energy is lost in passing through the dust and denser air. So we end with the thermal energy reaching surface targets reduced to considerably less than what it would be from an equal air burst. In the manual, Capabilities of Atomic Weapons, our graphs of thermal energy versus slant range to target reflect the losses due to lowering of burst height by employing one curve for surface bursts and a separate higher curve for air bursts of the same yield. In the case of the underground burst, the column of displaced earth does a still better job of obscuring the fireball. Much of the thermal output is absorbed in fusing and vaporizing the crater earth. The thermal radiation decreases steadily as burst depth is increased until quite soon a depth is reached from which so little heat is radiated laterally that thermal effects on surface targets become negligible. Now, the third major weapon effect, nuclear radiation. There is essentially no difference between the dosages from surface and air burst weapons. Thus, the curves given in the manual for initial gamma and neutron radiation from air bursts may also be used for surface detonations. Underground bursts, however, require new curves because they produce much lower dosages at given ranges. The difference is such that at equal ranges, a one kiloton burst centered only about 17 feet underground will give only half the initial gamma dosage an equally powerful surface burst would give and only one quarter of the air burst dosage. 
Greater burst depths would, of course, cause still greater attenuations, and other yields at the same scaled depth will follow the same pattern. Now, we come to one of the most important distinctions between air bursts and ground bursts, behavior of the residual radiation. You'll remember that we defined an air burst as one whose fireball does not touch the ground. The cloud from the air burst carries practically all the violently radioactive bomb debris to high altitudes, where it condenses out in very tiny particles and drifts away downwind. falling out so slowly, if at all, that it is normally of no importance from the standpoint of ground contamination. The exception to be remembered is that any rain that chances to catch the radioactive particles at moderate altitudes within hours after the burst may deposit them on the ground in significant concentrations. We defined our ground burst category as starting at the burst height where the fireball does touch the ground. From here on down, the situation begins to change radically because some of the dirt which is melted and scoured out of the crater and rises with the fireball and cloud becomes impregnated or coated with radioactive byproducts of the fission process. Some of these dirt particles, unlike the air burst particles, are heavy enough to fall back to Earth relatively close to zero. Some extremely small particles will drift for prolonged periods in the upper atmosphere and become essentially of no concern. As a rule of thumb for ground bursts, we can consider that out of the total amount of contaminating activity available from a given shot, a percentage of the activity roughly equal to the percentage of the fireball subtended by the surface of the ground will be deposited on the ground within such a time and distance from zero that the concentration is dangerous. A contact surface burst then, 50% subtended by the ground surface, will deposit some 50% of its contaminating activity within a significant distance from the burst. Changing our viewpoint to look down on the surface burst zero point, we find that the pattern of fallout contamination on the ground is approximately circular if there is no wind involved, which would be an extremely rare circumstance. If there is a wind, the heavier and lower particles will still show a concentration in the neighborhood of zero. But lighter and higher particles will land in a stretched out pattern downwind and may be dangerous to personnel over an area of many square miles. The gamma intensity is, as you'd expect, highest around the zero point and inside of the central contours of the pattern, shading off to lower intensities on the outside. Time is definitely an element in this connection because the radioactivity of the fallout material decays or loses strength quite rapidly in even the first few hours while it's in transit in the air as well as after it reaches the ground. Our major studies of fallout phenomena began with the first Nevada surface burst, a one kiloton affair, and reached a sort of temporary culmination with the megaton surface bursts of Operation Castle. The basic fallout mechanisms do not change with increases of yield. However, yield does largely govern the importance of the fallout. We'll take a brief look at a Castle report which considered fallout only in terms of very large yield weapons. Fallout history begins with the millions of tons of earth vaporized by such a detonation. This material, which rises with the fireball, has neither original nor induced radioactivity of any consequence. But during condensation, it traps radioactive bomb products 
significant for intense gamma. In the first few minutes, the visible cloud will reach from 60 to 100,000 feet or more for multi-megaton bursts with a stem over five miles in diameter. Fallout of the radioactive particles inside and below the visible structure now begins through the operation of gravity, rain out, convection, and other mechanisms. The active airborne particles move on downwind, causing significant fallout for a period of 10 hours or more. The settling dust reaches ground in a pattern which, while naturally quite variable, is reasonably represented as a long leaf shape. Starting back at the time of burst again, it is important to note that while the visible cloud will move with cloud height winds, the fallout particles will settle through lower winds of possibly conflicting directions at various heights. Orientation of the ground fallout pattern is determined by a resultant wind vector, which is an average of all winds from ground to cloud height. Therefore, the fallout pattern may take an entirely different path from that of the visible cloud. Changes in the average wind vector as the falling dust moves across country can cause major distortion of the fallout pattern. On the defensive side, it should be remembered that the gamma intensity of fallout at H plus seven hours has decayed to one-tenth of what it was at H plus one. And by H plus 48, it is only one one-hundredth of the H plus one value. Additionally, the shelter of a frame dwelling will cut the dose rate to one-half of the outside rate, and the position in the basement would reduce it to a tenth. Attenuations in excess of 1,000 can be gained in basements or middle stories of multi-story buildings or in simple shelters with at least three feet of earth overhead. In general, however, it should be recognized that the best average shelter available in cities will cut dose rates only to a level between one quarter and one eighth of the full dose. And that dose, I might add, can reach a lethal level for fully exposed personnel over an area amounting to thousands of square miles in the case of a weapon in the megaton bracket. Smaller yields can produce similar lethal dosages, but they will cover proportionately smaller areas. Shallow underground bursts will produce contamination of roughly the same order as a surface burst. As the depth of burst is moderately increased, more and more of the available contaminant is trapped and deposited as fallout, but the distribution changes. For illustration, say the surface or very shallow underground burst puts a 1,000 Rentgen per hour dose rate contour out this far. And a 10 Rentgen per hour contour reaches out to here. Then assume a somewhat deeper burst of the same yield. Dose rates in the immediate vicinity of zero become higher and the 1,000 R per hour contour area may increase like this while dose rates near the maximum ranges of significant effect become lower, and the 10R contour might shrink back to here. I think I should emphasize again the sensitive wind dependence of fallout distribution. Changes in the dominant winds can have a much greater effect on the areas and intensities of a fallout pattern than any moderate change of yield or depth of burst. Also, from the standpoint of military employment, it will be an extremely rare circumstance in which we will ever have enough knowledge of the winds and other factors to make a detailed prediction of the fallout patterns of any nuclear ground bursts, ours or the enemy's. Without excellent weather forecasts or equivalent data, not even a specialist can do more than predict the general sector in which the fallout will probably land and block out its intensities within perhaps a full order of magnitude. I would also like to emphasize that the only fallout contamination of any importance comes from the fission yield of a weapon. The portion of the yield that is contributed by the thermonuclear or fusion process in a so-called H-bomb does not produce any significant contamination. I've been speaking of contamination only in the sense of gamma radiation. This hazard is far greater than that of beta radiation, which has no short-term importance beyond production of skin lesions if a person is in actual physical contact with a contaminated material for a sufficient period. Our manual, Capabilities of Atomic Weapons, 
supplies a number of curves for guidance in calculating fallout parameters for surface and underground bursts. It gives data on contamination areas, doses, and dose rates for various yields, based where appropriate on an average scaling wind of 15 knots and a reference time of H plus one, or one hour after burst time. We have to select some arbitrary reference points like these in order to simplify fallout computations for practical utility. It would be impossible to make or use the great number of curves it would take to fit all the governing factors, even if we knew them, which we don't. One other mechanism which can cause significant ground contamination is the base surge. It appears that only shots fired underground will produce a base surge on land. And so far, our experience in that line has been confined to very low yield explosions, around one kiloton. The underground burst produces a dust column that is more vertical as well as more dense and stable than that of a surface burst. The column's dust particles and entrained air behave like an aerosol that is denser than air, falling back to the earth and spreading out radially along the surface in a low dust cloud, which deposits radiological contamination on the ground. This takes place over a period of minutes rather than seconds after the explosion. The main importance of the base surge is its ability to carry contamination rather quickly to upwind and crosswind areas which would otherwise be less affected by fallout. The base surge range and pattern in these directions will of course show a substantial wind sensitivity. Contour dimensions can also be considerably affected by the soil consistency. The shallowest burst which has been observed to cause an earth-based surge was a one kiloton shot at a 17 foot depth. Beyond this scaled depth, we can, for field purposes, almost ignore depth of burst, since multiplying the depth by a factor as great as 10 will not even double the radius over which the base surge will extend. Yield increases will have more effect since the base surge radius is expected to vary approximately as the cube root of the kiloton yield. To give some feeling for the dimensions involved in base surge effects, it's worth noting that, barring wind, a one kiloton burst at a 17 foot depth in Nevada soil can produce a base surge with about a half mile radius, whereas a shot at the same scaled depth, but with 1,000 times the yield, one megaton, will only give a base surge radius on the order of four or five miles, only eight or 10 times as far. This makes a good illustration of how little an increase in range we get from large increases in yield where cube root scaling is involved. We've got enough time now for a quick review of the high points. Subject, ground bursts. We'll start with a weapon detonated on the surface creating a typical crater edged with a raised lip of earth and surrounded by zones of ruptured or displaced soil. Destruction of underground installations by earth shock will be largely limited to these zones. As the burst center is moved underground and progressively deeper, the crater radius increases at a rapid rate at first, quickly reaching a size which can be only slightly changed by large further changes of burst depth. For a given burst depth, the radius will scale as the cube root of the yield. Crater depth also increases to a maximum, but at a slower rate, and with a given burst depth will vary as the fourth root of the yield. Next, we'll look at a sort of lineup of the major effects for a summary of their behavior. Consider this arrow as having a changeable length in order to represent the various distances an airburst can reach along the surface with each of its effects in turn one after another so we can compare them, not with each other, but with their ground burst equivalents from an equal yield. First, say the arrow represents blast wave range from the airburst. 
lower bracket overpressures from the surface burst will have somewhat less range than their air burst equivalent. Higher overpressures will have as much or greater range than from the air burst. Next, we'll let the base arrow represent the slant range of an air burst's thermal effects for any given yield and thermal intensity combination. The equivalent combination from a surface burst will have only some 60% as much range. Switching the base arrow to represent the slant range of some air burst's initial nuclear radiation of a given intensity, we find that the surface burst does just about as well, though with a slight reduction for low yields. Now we can simply flip the base arrow over and let it still represent the range of the air burst's various effects, this time compared to the effects of an underground burst. This can only be a rough comparison, so we'll use the word moderate to describe the burst depth on the order of 5 to 15 percent of the free fireball radius without trying to pin it down exactly. From underground, the lower overpressures now have only around half the range they could get from the air burst, and that half would shrink rapidly with any greater depth. The higher overpressures are still harder hit, losing practically all significant range along the surface. Thermal effects take the worst beating. They become negligible on surface targets from comparatively shallow burst depths. Initial nuclear radiation is still significant, reaching some 85% as far as the air burst slant range with a given dosage. Remember, this is a ratio of distance to a given dose. Don't try to reverse it to one of doses at a given distance. We can end by saying that blast, thermal, and initial nuclear radiation will all be quite effective, weapon-wise, from a surface burst, with very little inferiority to the capabilities of an air burst, with the main exception that the lower blast overpressures will lose range. As the burst center is moved underground, however, the ranges of almost all these weapon effects are quite rapidly reduced, with the obvious additional effect of enlarging the crater. Our final important subject is residual contamination. It's a hard subject to evaluate by the numbers, but we can make a few useful comparisons. We have seen that a burst whose fireball cuts substantially into the ground can contaminate considerable areas with a fallout pattern which is mainly wind dependent. With a ground burst and a normal wind structure, some contamination will be deposited a short distance upwind. And the bulk will fall in a longer downwind pattern. With the radioactively hottest areas close around the crater and along the center of the pattern. The winds may produce a very non-symmetrical pattern with little resemblance to the stylized leaf pattern. I think we can safely generalize that with a low velocity scaling wind, a contact surface burst will spread a dosage that is potentially lethal to exposed persons at least as far in every direction as any other equally significant weapon effect will reach, and probably several times as far downwind. Increase the scaling wind speed and the contours upwind will shrink while those downwind become longer and narrower. Possibly the crosswind contamination and certainly that which is downwind will still have a dangerous range exceeding that of any other significant effect. Moving the shot underground reverses the usual trend of reducing weapons effects. The low intensity contours shrink, but the hotter areas become still hotter, enlarging the range of the dangerous intensities. The base surge from underground bursts, you will remember as a cascade of dust falling back from the earth column and rolling out in a wave in all directions from zero.
This flow of dust is an efficient mechanism for carrying additional radiological contamination to upwind and crosswind areas, as well as for reinforcing the dosage for some distance downwind. Since the underground location of the burst has also reduced all other effects, we end up with a situation where, unless cratering is the main objective, we may find that the fallout contamination is by far our longest ranged and most significant weapon effect from the underground burst. Well, that completes our ground burst survey, so that's all for today.